Hello YouTube, today I'll be making a quick tutorial on the Google file system. So this will be a talk model around the paper that was released in around 2003-2004 by Google, talking about how they managed to operate at a very large scale using the Google distributed file system. So basically the higher level architecture, the motivating points, some of the techniques they use to ensure very fast performance, reliability, and proper design. So this is in contrast to other file systems, such as the Linux file system, network file systems, um, the Andrew file system, and so on. This prevents itself to a specialized use case that Google found that covered most of their use cases. So primarily, what I'm going to be going through is the overview through the paper. So I'm going to be covering the sections similar to the paper, but slightly differently. So I highly recommend checking the link down below. I'm going to be posting a link to the actual paper so you can read through at your own pleasure. I'm going to be showing some demonstrations on some specific cases that give intuition behind why the reliability guarantees and consistency model that the Google file system has is the way it is. And at a higher level, how do, how do all the different pieces fit in to ensure that the file system is working the way it's intended to be? So a little bit of history on the Google file system. Um, initially, it was basically inspired to meet the needs of Google's processing needs. So at the time, there were no existing file systems that were designed for this purpose. Uh, since then, the Hadoop Distributed File System, HDFS, came into play. But uh, effectively, what this allows you to do is they found that often when they were working with files, they tended to be larger files, so in the order of several gigabytes. And typically, a lot of their operations were sufficient to just simply do appends. So something that comes to mind when you're thinking about this is maybe MapReduce. So in a MapReduce operation, as you're dealing with all the maps, map and keys, you're typically appending to some sort of temporary file that needs then flush to disk. So they found that some of these specific attributes in dealing with these different files were more appropriate when you had um, simply a more, uh, more specific append operation instead of simply a write. So having this in mind, let's begin talking about how the Google file system works. So they made several assumptions. So obviously, failure is expected. It's not an anomaly. They're going to be working with large files, and typically we're going to be mostly focusing on the read and write operations. So what is there to know about the Google file system? So basically the way it's split up in the architecture is the following. So at the topmost part, we're going to have sort of this master server. So again, this can be replicated over several instances, but we're going to have this master node up here. Afterwards, alongside the master node, we're going to have our client over here, and the client is the one that does the request. And then afterwards, we have these separate chunks called chunk servers, which I'll explain in a moment. Actually, let me just use copy paste functionality here. Copy paste. Paste, paste, move these down here, move one more, whoops, and one more, okay. So we're going to have all these different chunk servers over here. Chunk server 1, chunk server 2, chunk server 3, chunk server 4, and chunk server 5. So these are chunk servers. Effectively, what the Google file system does is it takes a specific file and then partitions it into chunks of 64 megabytes. Now, why did they choose 64 megabytes? That's a very appropriate question. And the reason is you're basically having two different drawbacks. On one end, if you have chunks that are too large, which are larger than 64 megabytes, you're going to encounter internal fragmentation. Internal fragmentation means that if we take a specific chunk, and then bisect it carefully, we're going to notice that you might have data from a specific part over here with this entire thing being 64 megabytes, but then we're going to have some empty space over here that's basically empty. So this is called internal fragmentation. You might have come, uh, come up with this um, in your operating systems class, for example, when you were talking about virtual memory, so different ways of handling virtual memory or different ways of um, like paging and so on. So those are topics handled in the operating systems class. So this is where internal fragmentation comes from. The alternative is having super small chunks. So if you have like uh, 16 kilobyte chunks, 
then effectively what's going to happen is you're going to have 16 kilobyte chunks. You're going to have so many chunks, but for each one of them, you're going to have to store some metadata. And that metadata that you're storing, uh, that's just additional overhead. So Google engineers found that 64 megabytes was like an appropriate medium. So with uh, 64 megabytes, you can easily fit um, large terabytes, and then you won't be consuming too much data on the master node. So now I talked about this, maybe splitting it to chunks gives you a little bit of intuition behind what the chunk servers do, which is store the chunks. But how do we know where the chunks are stored? Well, that's what the master node's for. So the master node's going to be responsible for three things. First thing that's stored on the master node is the hierarchical information on the on um, terms of Linux. So this is the, uh, I guess you could call it like the file system hierarchy. So this is uh, storing all the information for regarding um, like the, f the tree in terms of how the files are stored. So it's called the namespace hierarchy. So this is like folders in Linux. Number two would be a chunk, a file to chunk mapping. And number three would be a chunk to chunk server mapping. With replicas. Okay, so effectively what's happening now is we have a client, we have a master node, and then we have a series of chunk servers. Now the client comes in and client says, okay, for this file, I'm interested in writing to this chunk or appending this chunk. So the very first thing that the file needs to do is it needs to figure out, hey, where do I actually go to acquire this? So what the client will do is it'll say, hey, for file one, for file like A, I need chunk three. How do I know what chunk three is? Well, if you have a specific offset, so let's say my operation here is um, write file A offset. Now offset would be 64 megabytes. If it's my third chunk, then it'd be 128 megabytes. And if it's the other one, then it would be uh, 192 megabytes. Let's say at 193 megabytes, I'm writing one megabyte data, okay? So the Google file system will say, okay, you're saying that, and then it'll return back a list of there are different chunk servers that have it. So chunk, we can say chunk server one, chunk server three, chunk server five. But chunk server one is the primary. Afterwards, what the client will do is it'll request it to all the different chunk servers. So it'll go off and say, oh, okay, chunk server one has it, chunk server three has it, and chunk server five has it. But the important thing to realize here is that we're not directly doing a write. And I'm going to be showing why, but effectively, when you do a request, you don't directly do a write. So it doesn't immediately flush the disk. Instead, it stores it in an in-memory buffer here. All the different changes by all of these will be stored in an in-memory buffer. And the reason for this in-memory buffer is that you don't know the order in which these will be executed. If I have two concurrent writes, I will need to ensure that the writes are written in a specific order. So this, this ensures one of the properties I'm going to be discussing afterwards when it comes to the Google File System's consistency model. The consistency model in the Google File System isn't necessarily the same as you'd find like in Dynamo, which has like eventual consistency. It's a more specific consistency model tailored specifically for the Google File System. So now that we're writing to all these in-memory buffers, then it'll ask the client will ask the primary replica to basically commit. When the primary replica commits, then it will decide the order. So what's critical here is understanding that the primary replica will, dis will be deciding the order in which all of the dis these different chunk servers are executed. So when it actually comes to flush into disk for any single write operation, this ensures that all of these will occur atomically. 
So if I have two different write operations afterwards, if I was writing inside of here in this one megabyte, I was writing something else. So not specifically one megabyte, but I was covering two different chunks. And it's possible that my writes would run, come in a specific order. Or if I had two sequences one after another, and then let's say the, the packets got delayed or something like that. And this would ensure for two separate TCP uh, packets inside the socket, when sending the stream uh, for two separate requests, then even though TCP guarantees that within the same stream, the order wouldn't get mixed up because it uses sequencing and so on, but if I had two separate write requests, then it would ensure that the order on which they're written on the different servers is uh, consistently defined throughout all of them. So now that this makes a little bit of sense, let's talk about the actual consistency model that uh, the Google file system has. And to do this, I'm going to be drawing a little chart. And this chart will hopefully shed some light into the way it works. So basically, well, the way I'm going to draw the chart is as follows. I'm going to be covering two operations and doing some definitions. Okay. So we have two things to cover here. So one of them is write. The other one is append. One of them is a serial write. And the other one is concurrent. So if I write serially, so that means one after another. My data will be defined. If I write concurrently, my data will be consistent, but not defined. And don't worry, I'll be defining these in a consistent, not defined. But if I append serially for both of these, actually, It'll be defined, but potentially inconsistent. So this is interesting. How does this actually work? What do these terms mean, first of all? Let's just briefly cover what they actually mean. So consistent means what you probably think it means across all of the different replicas restoring the same uh, byte or bitwise values. So across all replicas, but then what is defined so what, what can define mean? Define means that it doesn't necessarily need to be consistent, but it means that the data that you're reading actually makes sense. So the hidden meaning behind it, like the semantics of whatever you're reading, can be understood. And this will make more sense. It sounds a little bit abstract. But so long as the original meaning or the original intention Okay, my reading's unwritable, unreadable. As long as the original meaning is covered, it is defined. So let's cover some of these, try to understand what the heck they mean, and what I refer to them. So if I write serially, what I refer to that is I perform one write, and then I perform a second write, so long as we have this convention where we're doing the writes with the replicas and then the primary will go on to the other nodes and inform them to write it, then we will have defined state because if we have two consecutive chunks, the primary replica will ensure that the chunks afterwards will be written to disk at the appropriate time. Now, what does it mean by it's going to be consistent but not defined for concurrent writes? So for this, I'm going to give an interesting example on how if we do a write across two separate chunks, it's technically possible that we get consistent but undefined data. 
So let's just consider this interesting edge case, sort of, where we have a, let me see, let's do this color. If I have a chunk here that looks like this, so it's 64 megabytes, right? But then this file is split up into two. So we have some data here, some data here. Here is 64 megabytes. Here is 64 megabytes. Let's assume that the file starts here. So this is byte zero. OK. Now, we're going to be writing in between this layer here, such that here we have one megabyte. Here we have one megabyte. And we start at offset uh, 32. So we're going to be writing here and here. Now, will this be composed of two separate write requests? Yes, because we can only write to one chunk. The other chunk could be on a separate chunk server. You don't know. So you need to actually do two separate requests for this. So this will be a request one for this one. And this will be a request two. But then when you do a request two, right? It's totally possible that it gets tangled, right? So if I have a separate client afterwards that comes along, this down here, I'm gonna have a separate client now. This client over here. This is another customer, and he does the exact same thing. But he now covers two, so I'm going to have all of these. And I'm going to be doing the same request that I did before, with the exception that now I'm going to be covering two, two, uh, two, ch two chunks. So I do it again, my request. I get back for one of the chunks. This is one of them. My other client then will also do another request, get back a series of chunks. And then this request will go to chunk server one. Let's just say it's two for now. So chunk server one and three. So this one says for for the first chunk. Chunk one. And I got chunk server one, chunk server three. Similarly, the master node here, I want uh, chunk server one, chunk for chunk one. It'll go there. But then this one will also go here. This one will also go here. But then afterwards, I need to do my second request, right? So my second request will say, hey, I want chunk two. And then this one will say, oh, OK, go to chunk server two, chunk server four. So then my client goes to chunk server two, and then it goes to chunk server four. And similarly, this guy is over here, comes here, chunk server two, uh, chunk two, sorry, chunk two, chunk server two, chunk server four. And this person does also a request here. Okay, well, I mean, this sounds reasonable. This is what the expected behavior would be. But what actually happens behind the scenes? So recall that I said that the primary replica will decide in which order the other um, slave replicas will be performing the write. So this, is, this was to ensure that when we have sequential writes, that it's going to be in a defined manner. But now there's another thing to consider here. And the other thing to consider is that what if the first chunk server, this chunk server one will have to make a decision, basically. Chunk server one will have to decide, OK, am I going to run client ones? First or client two? But then chunk server two, which is the primary, so these are the primaries. We'll have to decide, OK, am I going to run client one first or client two? Now, in the Google file system client, uh, chunk server one, chunk server two do not communicate. There's no wire of communication between them. So there's no guarantee in the system of client one and client two being first. Moreover, there's no guarantee that we can say, oh, but maybe client one does the request first, so then we can always guarantee client two. That's not necessarily true. It's possible that the, that the network goes down for client one, and then it sends the TCP packet later to the master node, or client two calls it later. All of these things are possible things that can happen. So there's no guarantee specifically that chunk server two 
uh, can possibly um, always have this heuristic where you pick the first one first. So what actually happens in that case? Well, across all the replicas inside of here, this one, let's say, will be chunk server 1. So this is chunk server 1 data. Okay. But then chunk server 2, so chunk server 1 writes last. So I guess chunk server 2 goes first. And then in the second one, chunk server 2 goes uh, goes last, and chunk server 1 goes first. So let's go back to our thing. Is it consistent? I would say it's consistent because all the replicas are following exactly from the primary, right? All the replicas are written in the same behavior because we wrote to the temporary buffer and then we um, f synced it to disk. But then in terms of defined, is it defined? I don't think it is defined because now we could have potentially garbage data. Let's say one of them was to set all the bits to zero and the other one was to set all the bits to one. Now half of it would be zeros and half of it is one. That does not follow the defined constraint that we mentioned before. So now we get a little bit of intuition behind right and how serial and concurrent works. I guess uh, I'm going to break it down into two videos. So in the next video, I'm going to be talking about the append operation and how we actually fix this. And this is one of the um, flagship reasons why the Google file system is in use. Because this append allows us to have defined, potentially inconsistent, but defined data. And that's the most important because the data will have intrinsic meaning. So yeah, stay tuned for the next video. I'll post the link down in the description below. And uh, thanks for watching.